Jenny, where better to begin this episode, which is thinking about baptism, than Salisbury Cathedral? And particularly Salisbury Cathedral because it has this stupendous font that was installed recently in 2008 and is the most stunning visual object. It's extraordinary because as you approach the font, the water is so still that it actually looks far more mirror-like with these amazing reflections yeah. of the stained glass. You don't realise it's water until you hear the sound of this pouring over the edges and you realise that this is alive. <laughs> well, living water is a wonderful way of putting it and, of course, deeply symbolic because this is, this is the water in Christian tradition. The water of baptism gives life. And the fact that it's moving all the time, not static, but moving all the time, I think communicates that sense of life. The water has life and the water gives life. Absolutely, and you can see how William Pye, who designed this, he's a, he's a water sculptor by tradition, and he approaches the design of this font very carefully. You can see not only has he thought about the inscriptions to include, but also he's looked back to the early traditions of baptismal fonts. And of course, in that early Christian tradition, it was a baptism of full immersion. Mm. And of course, that's still practiced today, but more often, um, we see infant baptisms, a baptism by effusion. And that, of course, is when the priest takes up water, sometimes with his hand or a little cup or a shell, and just pours it over the child's mm. head. So it's referring back to this very early tradition in the church, isn't it? Just by its sheer size, that's right. And also its shape, because it's in the shape of a cross, it's cruciform. And this is fundamentally important as well because what Christians believe is that when they're baptised, they're united with Christ in his death and also in what lies beyond his death, which is his resurrection. And the inscriptions, as you say, pick up exactly on these themes. This one says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. God guaranteeing safe passage, if you like, through death to a safe arrival on the other side. But part of that passage through the water surely is about that kind of ritual cleansing as well, both literal and washing. symbolic. It's a symbol, it's yes. a symbol also of washing mm. and the washing away of sin, mm -hmm. which is a, a very um, important continuity with the baptism of John the Baptist. Of course, he wasn't offering a baptism of union with Christ because Christ hadn't yet died or been risen, but he was offering a baptism of purification, of washing away sins. Mm. And that is a, a hugely important aspect of the language that's used in the liturgy of, of baptism. There are many symbols uh, in, in the liturgy. Water is the central element, and it's fascinating that we owe that to John the Baptist himself. Yes. In many uh, traditional forms of baptism, oil was used to anoint, mm -hmm. and in some cases still is. The dressing in new clothes, white clothes, to symbol symbolize the purified state. Mm. Giving a name is something that happens at a baptism, a name to the child, but also using the name of God, the Trinitarian name of God, Father, mm. Son, and Holy Spirit. So I baptize thee. In the name three, of the, 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 the Father, of the, the Son, Holy Ghost. Absolutely, yes. and that's an essential. And one last very important element is the giving of a, of a lighted candle. And that too symbolizes transition from darkness, the darkness of sin, to light, the realm of new existence, purified existence. It's very interesting when, when I hear you talk about light and dark, it strikes me that that's something that um, artists often pick up on and sort of use it as part of their visual language. And I'm thinking in particular of the National Gallery's painting by Adam Elsheimer, who really uses that dramatic contrast of light and dark to make a lot of the points that you were just describing. Before we go back to the National Gallery, we should have a little... It would be... A wonder around. It would be unjust not to. Ben, this is the painting I was thinking about when we were in Salisbury Cathedral and you were talking about light and dark. And it's um, Adam Elsheimer's, he's a German artist. It's his painting on copper of the baptism of Christ by John. It was painted in about 1599. And the reason I thought of it is that particularly, do you see this foreground figure cast in shadow? Mm. And the way that is sort of playing off of the figures in the light behind mm. him. And so it seems that this figure 
who seems to be undoing his sandals, is preparing himself for baptism. And behind him, you actually have the figure of John in the act of baptizing Christ. He's the one who's bending over here. And can you see just the key moments are picked out in light, notably John the Baptist's hand with the trickle of water there. Yeah. And that play of light and dark um, reminds me of aspects of the baptismal ritual. I bet a, a Christian looking at this image would have identified this dark figure and perhaps the one behind who seems to have been baptised and is in the light as representing their own Christian transition from darkness to light. Mm. And um, what's Alzheimer's particularly known also for his landscapes. And you see this beautiful, very German looking, lush forest landscape. And I'm always delighted by the inclusion of this waterfall that seems so closely associated with oh. John the Baptist. You see, it seems to almost be falling on his head. It's true, a cascade there and then another cascade from his hand to to Christ, that's beautiful. Isn't it? It seems to me that like the whole picture, the, the separating of light and dark, the highlighting of light, and the, and the emphasis on, on shade in contrast to light, has an element of, of judgment, even in some ways an anticipation of the last judgment. And there's other things in the picture too that speak of that. The heavens opening, heaven is shining down through this gap in the clouds, and bringing out where there's good, where there's bad, where there's light and where there's dark. And even talking of details, the tiny, tiny figures, you can barely see them up on the hillside at the top left. They seem to me to be amongst various felled trees, again, a sort of symbol of judgment that John used mm -hmm. in his preaching. He said that the ax is laid to the root of the trees, the unworthy That's trees, right. which will be cut down and destroyed. Yes, and as you describe that kind of rending of the skies, and I love how these puti are encircling their arms and creating what I always think of as a, a kind of celestial architecture. They become like a cupola or a lantern, allowing that beam of light to enter. Yeah. And it's extraordinary that um, Alzheimer can include so much in this tiny little copper, which I think must have been used in the domestic interior. This mm. is a small work that requires this sort of close You've looking near it. examination. And it provides a very nice contrast with um, a painting we have here of the same subject, that Piero della Francesca baptism that we looked at in the introduction. And if you think about the, um, the idea that they're representing the same subject, but in a very different visual language. And I think that, that language has to do with Northern artists and Italian artists, but also for the very function of the image. This one for a domestic interior, for quiet, individual contemplation perhaps, yeah. and the other is an altarpiece that would be inviting congregations from, and that would be visible from a great distance. So perhaps we should revisit the Piero and have another look. Ben, this is Piero della Francesca's altarpiece um, that was painted for the Camaldolese Abbey in Borgo San Sepolcro, this little town in Tuscany. And uh, unlike the tiny little Alzheimer that we just looked at, you can see already the scale of this picture. It's meant to be read from a distance, and it's, the visual language is entirely different from what we saw in Alzheimer. Curiously, the architecture of the gallery gives us a little bit of a sense of it having its own space and its own chapel, almost a sort of chapel, isn't it? Precisely, and actually this room in the National Gallery was designed specifically for this artwork, so that you would be able to approach it in a sort of quiet, more contemplative mode. Well, it's a beautifully contemplative atmosphere, isn't it? The, the stillness of these floating clouds and the sense that the dove, which represents the Holy Spirit, is almost like one of those clouds, just poised, incredibly still, directly mm -hmm. above Christ's head. Almost perspectively, of course, that dove seems to be flying out into our space. Gero is known as an absolute master of perspective, and he was very interested in science and in optics. And um, what you actually see here, and this confuses a lot of people, I think, including our students, but it looks like you can see the pebbles of a riverbed mm. and that actually Christ is not standing in the water. What it seems to be represented, in fact, is that we, the beholder, <laughs> are standing in the riverbed as well. And you know when you approach a river, if you look directly down, you can see the, the pebbles and, let's say, the fish at the bottom of the river. But if, if the you angle's look, right. Precisely, yeah. but if you look at a distance, you might well see something like this, the reflections of the clouds. And, and it seems that Piero has beautifully evoked that in, the, yes. in his baptism. And Christ's feet and the Baptist's feet are placed at exactly the point where our vision shifts hmm. from seeing through the water to seeing just onto the surface, which feels to me like a wonderful metaphor for how you might always see more. I mean, in this scene, there are many mysteries. The kind of difference between literal seeing 
and figurative or metaphorical or spiritual scene. Yeah. It's like Piero's riffing on that. It's odd that Christ is baptised in Christian tradition because he is sinless, so he doesn't need to be baptised. And John actually says that I shouldn't be baptising you, you ought to baptise me. Mm. Um, and it remains something of a mystery in Christian tradition, but it's often been thought that the main purpose of it is to show his total solidarity with humanity. But of course there's different kinds of baptism. And in this one, yes, we see John's baptism of Christ, but John himself undergoes a sort of baptism, doesn't he? he does. Of a different kind. He does. Not Christian baptism as such, as in the sacrament, but he, at the end of his life, will be martyred. And uh, martyrdom was viewed by the early church as equivalent to baptism, or indeed another kind of baptism, baptism in blood. And that, I think, is what we're going to look at in our next episode, isn't it? Exactly. We're going to focus on John's martyrdom. <laughs>